Okay, hi. Share my screen. Start this presentation. Okay, this is my first time doing one of these Zoom recordings, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, so we've created this presentation to discuss some historical events and figures that we've been inspired by. Um, for ERM, learning from history is especially important because we're getting involved in city planning and politics. And since we're building off of many other factors that have led up to this point, we want to learn from past mistakes and successes to move forward. Uh, so here we're just starting out with an overview of the key themes we're going to analyze in this presentation. Uh, you'll notice they aren't limited to people or historical events. We also go into art styles and social movements to explain why some of our brand is designed the way that it is. Um, it's really important to design your style early on in the brand building process because that way you can keep it clear and consistent and build trust with followers and people who are part of your movement. Uh, a great example of this with clear branding is Ford Motor Company. Their logo and design styles have stayed the same for over a century and everyone in the world is able to recognize one of their cars, builds a genuine trust between them and their customers. So this slide is just explaining that this presentation is about the research we conducted and the next two sections will be about how we plan to apply our key takeaways to the brand. Um, and then some of the graphics and projects we'll create using those new navigational guidelines. So here we jump into our very first theme, which is romanticism. The slide explains that romanticism is a mindset practiced by a wide range of artists in the early 1800s. It leaned heavily on symbols and emotion, which was a bit revolutionary at the time when the enlightenment had taken over and things were more logic and science focused. These artists saw a benefit in human emotions and how you can move people in a much deeper way when empathizing with them um, than if you could by just reasoning with them. It gave people space to voice their values and ideas in a way that was more about morals and empathy. It was also very inspired by Gothic, by the Gothic movement, which we'll get into, but here we're gonna flip through a few examples of romantic paintings. Um, so you'll notice that they all utilize dramatic lighting, looser brushstrokes than you would see in like the classical movement. Um, they definitely evoke emotion, there's dramatic expressions and the subject matter is kind of less focused in reality. Um, so a lot of them are really beautiful. Um, so romanticism wasn't just about painting. It also spread to politics, writing, and other forms of art. So this is a list of some of the key romantic figures we took lessons from. Oscar Wilde was a very strong voice in support of a lot of progressive movements that seemed way out there at the time. He was very witty and eloquent, and his writing remains timeless. Although he could be cynical and sarcastic, he held a lot of hope for the world and the people in it. One of his quotes here, there's here's some pictures of him, first of all. He eventually went on trial, um, but he, all of his writings, very eloquent. He's, there's really beautiful quotes. Um, that's his grave, everybody loves him. So um, one of our favorite quotes reads, it takes a great deal of courage to see the world in all of its tainted glory and still love it. So even though he could be cynical, he still had a lot of hope and that's really important. Um, Lord Byron was a friend to many of the romantic writers and father of Ada Lovelace, who later became the world's first computer programmer. Byron was very unique because despite being upper class, he chose to support the revolutions in many countries. So Greece actually hailed him as a hero because he supplied them with money and manpower to fight their middle-class war. He was an accomplished writer who celebrated women and their talents, and he believed that wealth only makes you feel good if you can share it with others. And um, he's a great one to include because we're talking about learning from the past and how it shapes ERM's future. And he has a quote right here that says, the best profit of the future is the past. So here we'll move on to Mary Shelley. Um, Mary Shelley is responsible for creating the first piece of science fiction, Frankenstein, super popular. 
She used creativity and storytelling to make predictions about the future and human nature. She was a radical anarchist who wrote many works about reforming civil society. No man chooses evil because it is evil. He mistakes it only for happiness, the good he seeks. You'll notice a pattern too here um, in the people that we've chosen to reflect on, although they're realistic about the state of them too. So here's some Mary Shelley quotes, some things that we included here. Um, this is one that we just discussed. No man chooses evil because it's evil. This means to it. Um, here's Mary Shelley, inspired a lot of art about her. Frankenstein. Then we move on to Jane Austen. So Jane Austen was a woman who decided to support herself rather than marrying. Um, back then, when you're a woman in the lower classes, you the only way that you can move up and not be poor is by marrying up because you couldn't really get a job. So you're basically choosing between love and a life of poverty or just marrying, you know, to take care of yourself. Um, so this was, she decided to support herself by writing, and this was very brave in her time as women were not taken seriously enough to have jobs that could allow them to live a comfortable life. She took the risk and lived by her pen and became a best-selling author without changing her name to a man's to sell more books. She paved the way for everyone's voice to be taken seriously despite their gender. She embraced her delicateness rather than forcing herself to become more masculine, and she believed in tenderness and said that it was something to be taken seriously in an uncertain world. So here's Jane Austen, her Regency era clothing. Some quotes, you can see that rather than forcing women to be more masculine to get farther in life, she said we should embrace being kind and delicate and not see them just as feminine traits. Um, and then yes, she was very, very clear about how she wanted women to have educations and jobs. Um, and her work is still referenced today. This is a movie, Emma, one of her really famous novels. Um, and then we move on to David Caspar Friedrich, who was a 19th century German romantic painter. Um, he used heavy symbolism in landscapes and chose to focus on everyday subjects rather than just the wealthy. So you'll see a lot of images of farmers or people on the docks. Um, and he painted during a time of extreme consumerism, but decided to focus on spirituality and the natural world rather than just material objects. Eugene Delacroix is, oh wait, here we go. Got David there, that's his portrait. And then he also wrote poetry. Then here are a few, here's one of the images. We A few of the images in the romantic paintings were his as well. Um, so Eugene Delacroix was a, he led the French Romantic movement, and he eventually kind of developed the Impressionist movement that went on to become very big after this. Um, but he painted many scenes of the revolution and was inspired by Greek and Roman art. He was important because he depicted scenes of war and current events in history in a way that really inspired people and moved them to change. Um, yeah. So this was him, this was his portrait. You can see his brush strokes are getting a lot looser. So that's where we're going from this classicism to the impressionism, which was more about just capturing an emotion um, rather than depicting things perfectly. So you'll see lots of tiny little visible brush strokes rather than perfectly smooth ones. Um, and so here we've got a few of his quotes saying one always begins by imitating, you need to learn history to improve and do something better in the future. Here's one of his paintings. Okay, and now we're going to go on to Gothic art, which we briefly mentioned when describing Romanticism. Um, it was a hugely important movement due to the fact that art and reading began to spread to the middle class during this period, whereas previously it was only enjoyed by the upper classes. So these are some of the subject areas that we are inspired by in terms of Gothic art. Stained glass is really important because it was used by the church to tell stories in a time where very few people could read. It was symbolic and crucial in communicating. It is still very prevalent today because although language has changed, the pictures can be interpreted by anyone forever. Different colors mean different things. Here's a few examples. 
Um, so yeah, the different colors mean different things and they still subconsciously influence us today. Um, colors and modern logos are still kind of based on this. They all have meanings and feelings that they give you. So the Gothic era was also very important because it was when the first printer was used. So people would carve into blocks of wood and then use them to stamp text and art. Um, and so this was important because back then books were very, very expensive because they had to be handwritten, hand drawn. And so it was only the ultra wealthy who could have them and read um, and see art. So um, rather than just relying on the church and the upper classes to tell them stories and news, uh, the news was shared from the ground up within all the communities. Reading became widely accessible and it accelerated the enlightenment from there. Um, so here's an example of a woodcut print. They would just carve this into the wood. Like here you can see we still do it today and then you just press it onto a piece of paper. Here's another one they got very detailed. Um, then, like we said, language changes so much, even in just 100 years, when you read something from like the 1800s, it's, it's sometimes the words are hard to recognize, they don't have the same meaning anymore, we've just never even seen it, or the grammar might be different. Um, so how you create messages that can be interpreted a 1000 years into the future. Esoteric symbols are a language that transcends cultures, no matter what your spoken language is, you can see and understand the message. Symbols are easy to unpack once you understand the basic language they speak. This will allow you to interpret many different forms of art and storytelling. So here, like some examples, like we kind of know that this means radiation. We know that this stands for Christianity and um, doesn't rely fully on language. So we use traditional English heraldry symbols to design a crest that represents our brand. Learning from history is a huge part of our movement. Um, so we chose to focus kind of on rebirth and renewal and we wanted our symbols to reflect that. So here's an example of our crest. Then we'll go into the different meanings of each object here. Um, so the Ouroboros can sometimes have negative connotations with people because the snake is just very emotional for some people. Um, but the snake in this case represents its positive attributes for us. So the Ouroboros typically means rebirth and the snake means flexibility, global prevalence, it's on every continent um, and sophistication. Ooh. And then Lily, it's pretty simple. It's just a symbol of peace and virtue used in you know weddings a lot. The nightingale is considered the voice of nature because it can make so many sounds. You always hear its song. Um, it's really beautiful. It inspires a lot of people, um, but it's said to speak for the unheard, the part of nature that can't speak. Um, and then ivy, lastly, it attaches to things and will not let go. It perseveres through winter and wind and it is ever good. Now we're gonna get into some of our favorite revolutionaries. Uh, here we've got our first person, Toussaint Louverture, uh, was a powerful Haitian general in a time where Africans were being enslaved. Um, he liberated many and lived to be a very strong leader. So this is some of his quotes down here. Have some images of him as a Haitian general. Salvador Lendi was the first democratically elected socialist leader in Chile and was very popular with his country. He was assassinated by outside forces, but delivered a final speech where he urged his people to persevere in the face of those who wanted to disrupt democracy. Few of his quotes down here, but he delivered a very brave last speech um, and upheld democracy. So Alexander Hamilton is somebody a lot of people know, but he was one of the United States founders and is responsible for ratifying our constitution and designing some of our financial systems. He came from poverty and fought hard to liberate the people of his country and anyone who wanted to work for a better life. One of his most favorite quotes is, those who stand for nothing fall for everything. Sophie Scholl's on our list because she is a great example of how someone can always change. Um, she was raised in the Nazi party, and then rebelled and technically committed treason by spreading anti-fascist literature. She was eventually put to death when she was still a child, but refused to go back on her ideals. Um, so she and her brother would distribute literature standing up for the Jewish people. 
Um, and for this, she was hung and her last quote, she remained very strong, um, said an end in terror for me is prefer preferable to a terror without end for everyone. So Mika White is our most modern revolutionary on this list. He was the brain power behind Occupy Wall Street, and we love him because he's incredibly realistic about what he does and what doesn't work when protesting. So he's kind of redesigning protest as we know it, just to get it back to a place where it makes meaningful change rather than just being social media fodder. Um, so he obviously, he was behind Occupy Wall Street. He found that they had demands that kind of failed. And so he wrote a book about what he learned from it and where he's going from here. This is him. And this was imagery from Occupy Wall Street. Okay, so we also take inspiration from many philosophers and here are a few of them on our list. Um, Tolkien is one of the first on the list because of the amount of time he put into designing his new fantasy world. So he put years into laying systems and groundwork before he would write his first story. Um, and ERM itself has taken five years to research and work on systems that can support a large political and financial movement. So we, um, years ago, when we started researching and starting this movement, we really took his story to heart because he did organize things and set his ideals very much down in the beginning before he just started writing. And that's something we followed on. We've created a backlog of a lot of imagery, a lot of information and research that we've done that we're just now using. Um, so Kant makes a list because his stances on ethics have molded many systems as they exist today. He essentially just believed in basic human rights and respect for all in a time where that was kind of revolutionary. Um, so Jean-Jacques Rousseau's political philosophy influenced the progress of the Enlightenment throughout Europe. So he also influenced aspects of the French Revolution. Um, he believed in a direct democracy in which everyone voted to express the general will and to make the laws of the land. He supported small scale democracy and was a leader in the revolution. So Noam Chomsky was the father of modern linguistics. Um, he was a revolutionary, revolutionary cognitive scientist and philosopher. Um, his theory of universal grammar says that we're all born with an innate understanding of the way language works. Um, and we kind of chose him for his political positions and just his intellectual positions um, in politics in the United States. Um, one of his most favorite famous quotes is, if we don't believe in freedom of expression for people we despise, we don't believe in it at all. So it's a picture of him. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a British author and intellectual of the 20th century, responsible for the fantasy series, The Chronicles of Narnia, and other great works of fiction. Um, he was involved in a lot of medieval and Renaissance literature education, was very influential during his time. So that's important when we're discussing Gothic art and Romanticism. Um, he was actually converted to Christianity by the help of his close friend, um, Tolkien. And so they became very close to during the years and created a lot of great things together. Um, and so we were talking about laying the groundwork for years. We studied Tolkien um, where he would lay out his whole fantasy system, all of his characters, just very in detail. Um, and we believe in systems as well. So uh, our three C's, the three things we live by are clarity, consistency, and cohesion. Uh, we say if you find yourself doing the same thing 10 times, you make a shortcut so that thing can be done automatically. Um, so we iterate and we repeat until things are perfect. Creating stable infrastructure and testing things from an objective point of view gives us a strong base to grow from. Um, even with advertisements and reaching out to people, we do everything from A-B testing um, and just look at it from a scientific point of view to reach as many people as possible. Um, we do all the world building ahead of time and don't become shaky with our values. Like we said, it took five years to complete the groundwork to form this movement. Now it's kind of ready for takeoff and we're just sharing here some of the historical stuff that we studied to get to where we are. Um, so we kind of brushed on this, but storytelling is incredibly important to ERM. Um, world building, as it's called now, is a concept used by many large corporations to brainstorm about what the future could look like. 
So something that sounds like a science fiction story like Ready Player One could actually be an inspiring manual for directing change in the lives of those who partake. So to galvanize a movement, you have to bring out people's empathy as well as their logic. Um, that's what we've learned from romanticism and the revolution. And so strategic storytelling and getting people to feel very strong emotions can bring flat, flat data into well-rounded and exciting plans. So uh, sustainability has definitely become a buzzword and we reject that in favor of resiliency. So this means creating structures and systems that can resist cracking under extreme change and pressure. So a solid foundation, like we said, is the key to growing a movement. We focus on supplying power during extreme weather changes, creating building materials resistant to stress, establishing smart contracts for law and order that prevent one member from gaining too much control, having many avenues of funding and cash flow to support the movement from ups and downs, creating a global network, and focusing on the physical and mental health of all of our members through all the support we can give them financially, emotionally, or other. So a common theme in each of our emblem symbols is this feeling of growth and new life. And like we've said, we've studied history and seen that most things move in cycles. Um, so the plan is to identify and iterate different ways to improve, keeping our movement flexible. Everything comes from something. And while we know our ideas are all radical and new, it's about how we implement them and the new technology we use to do so. So we've chosen Detroit as our headquarters and it kind of bothers us when some people refer to it as a blank slate, just because economic hardship has chased many out of the area. Um, Detroit is rich in art, culture, and existing community. And rather than turning it into our own vision, we work with the existing people and structure there. So Metropolis is the name of our first ERM zone, and we've taken a broken down warehouse with good bones and breathed life back into it. So there are plants, people, and ideas, and we are constantly changing and growing. And that's all for now. That was Antiquity. All done.